are you the moonshine guy? And I was like, well, I'm not. <laughs> Oh, the interview thing. Yes, yes, yes. That's good. Um, she said, "Well, I think you have a. Uh, I think you'd be interested in what my uncle has to say." And I said, "Okay." And she said, "I have a CD of him being recorded years ago, and uh, he was involved in moonshining, I think." And I said, "What's his name?" She said, "Louis Carlos." And then when I woke up, oh. and I was done. <laughs> I said, "Oh, yes, he was. He was, pro he was probably involved." Um, but let's see what the interview shows. So. Um, this is a, a fantastic, beautiful 24-minute interview with him. I don't know who interviewed him. The, the lady who provided me with the CD wasn't sure, um, but she said, you know, that's, that's Uncle Louie's voice there. Um, and I'm going to play a short clip from there, a minute or two, because he really perfectly captures kind of the thesis of all my research and my, my project along the way here. Um, but uh, what I will say is in the background there's a, a dripping sound that's going on and that's because he has, the interview was done in his cabin and he had to keep the water running so the pipes wouldn't freeze. So just bear with it. Um, is Perry still here? I don't know where the audio cord is. Uh, if you could. Um, but, so, what he talks about in the, the broad interview, you know, that's 20 minutes, we'll, talk, we'll listen to maybe a minute or two of it, is that he produced Moonshine from, he says, 1930 to 1935. And the interviewer asked him, well, if Prohibition ended in 33, why did you have to keep producing? And he said, well, it took a long time to get everybody's thirst met. You know, it's happened. <laughs> <laughs> it happened pretty suddenly, so we had to keep doing it, and it was cheap, and people had kind of <coughs> developed a taste for certain types of illicit liquor, so they wanted to continue with that trend. Um, he had many locations in eastern Wisconsin, a couple in the Holy Land. He talks about one in Brothertown, then he talks about, well, as soon as we got it set up, it burned to the ground. He talked about another one down in the Horicon Marsh area, that as soon as we got it set up, the, they were raided by the, the prohibition agents. So, he had kind of this very interesting interview that went on. He would sell to a distributor in either New London or Chicago. He was independent of Al Capone, that name always comes up. But he said, no, no, I, I knew he had stills in the area. I knew he was somewhat, um, you know, he was obviously involved in things in our area, but I didn't have anything to do with him. Uh, he talks extensively about bribery being very common, and then he also obviously talks about being shot in the back. What he um, talks about is, is that's really fascinating is the logistics. So he says, well, we have these large wooden cisterns, which are essentially big barrels. They're essentially, if you take a, 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 a wooden cask or a wooden barrel and you cut it in half and you kind of have two bowls, that's what a cistern was. <coughs> in each vat, they would place 200 pounds of sugar and four pounds of yeast. He talks about the stills themselves, so that fractional distillation thing that the, the alcohol scene would travel up. They were 35 feet tall and they were three feet in diameter. So I mean, these are very large, lots of material sort of things that are being built. And he had multiple of these floating around and he's one guy. The worm bucket, um, which was the portion where that coiling of tubing went down inside with cool water to help with condensation, was six feet by four feet. So I mean, you could stand in this thing easily. Each operation required 13 or 15 individuals to run. So these were not sort of things that were one-man operations. These were very large, very intricate uh, logistical challenges. He talks extensively about how he didn't really worry about the law too much. He would, tell, he would say how when somebody arrived on scene from the prohibition department or identified themselves as a revenue agent, if you will, he would just bribe them. We'd just give them money and they'd go away. And we'd just have to keep paying them and they would just leave us alone. He didn't worry about them so much. He was more worried about hijackers during the transportation from the still to their distributor. And he tells one very um, entertaining story of where they were driving along and they were attempted to be hijacked. And they overcome, they beat up the guy who was trying to hijack them and they drop him off at the police station in Fond du Lac. <laughs> so the interviewer, you can just hear like the, like, in this voice. And he's like, so let me get this straight. You were transporting moonshine. 
you beat this guy up, and then you drop him off at the police station, he's like, yeah, why not? Like, well, that doesn't make any sense. And he goes, oh, they were on the take. We all knew them. That was not a big deal. So it was very much a who you knew sort of situation. Um, oh, where'd she go? You want to see Terry? Yeah, she's with the fan. Terry? Yes. Do you have the audio cord I meant to get? Oh, boy. I hope so. Okay. Um, well, she's getting that figured out. Um, I'll just, we'll, we'll come back to this. But. So some interesting pieces. Um, these are usually the more interesting portion of the, the talk. So this is a collection of stories I found, newspaper articles, that sort of thing. So Moonshiner's Cave, um, that was you know in the newspaper. There's a gentleman here last time who said, oh, I'll take you out there once the leaves are off. Um, I found out later, it is actually on the grounds of the women's prison. Um, <laughs> so so um, the, the benefit of, you know, so I know a guy who knows the, the warden, and it apparently will not be too big of a deal to be able to go and look at this site. It's apparently been boarded up, but plenty of folks went there when they were kids. Uh, the history of it is pretty interesting. It was actually a brewery back in the um, eight, late 1800s, Springtime Brewery, and uh, it was carved out of the rock. It looks very similar to this, I've been told, and it was basically, it allows a constant temperature. It allows for lagering of beer. So, um, over here. process or laundering to take place consistently. There was um, a stone, kind of unique stone formation called Tabletop Rock that was near the, the stream that was there. People would go out there and have picnics, um, but since then it's still on the grounds of the women's prison, so maybe a little careful if you're going to go adventuring over there. Um, uh, uh, so, and then... No. We can try, try this. So the mic's on, right? Yeah, we can do Okay. okay. All right, here we go. point of that um, audio portion is that basically in the Holy Land, moonshine itself, physically, the, the sale of it, the production of it, was one of the very few places for cash, cold hard cash, to come into the Holy Land during not only the agricultural but also the Great National Depression. So he talks about how if it weren't for moonshiners, if it weren't for those guys coming in from Chicago, if you will, many of the local merchants would not have been able to survive because the coal sellers, the merchants in each community, they relied on that five tons of coke or a type of smokeless coal that was being consumed by each still per week. Now that's a large that's a large order every week to rely on. The train, hey, that brought extra freight. They didn't care where that, that stuff was going. They were getting paid to haul it. The service stations that were in each community, all those moonshiners and bootleggers, you know what, they needed to fuel their vehicles, they needed maintenance, they needed oil, those sorts of things. They went to the local businesses. For the farmers, if they were renting out their farm, they were paid a premium. If they were able to hire out their sons or daughters to help out at the still, then they were getting paid a premium. 
If they weren't, and they just happened to be in the area, they were often paid to keep their mouths shut as well. <laughs> um, it also helped to inflate sugar prices for corn and beets. So it, on a kind of a broader scheme, it helped to support them. And then, as I said, neighbors were paid to keep their mouths shut. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to play the audio today, but I think oral history, hearing his voice, hearing that is incredible. There's a copy of the CD here at this library. There's one at um, the Malone Area Heritage Museum as well. So if you just go there and you ask for a copy of the CD, you can certainly listen to the whole interview. I think it's, it's, it's a, just a good listen. Um, but if you have a particular story, everyone's, every story is unique. You have a good one, or I should say good one. You have some interesting stories that you really want to capture and pass on. I really encourage you to record that now while you can. Um, one thing that I grew to really appreciate with this project is that the people that I would love to have interviewed passed away 20 years ago. So um, in 20 years, not all of us are going to be here. It's the reality of life. So capture those stories on audio so that folks can hear your voice, or write that down and, and keep that so people can hear it in the future. Um, there's a, a prohibition agent that talks about moonshiners have a PhD in their own, and uh, the Holy Landers were no different. So they did different things to get by, to survive, and so they would wrap a barn, like I talked about with cardboard or, or um, tar paper on the inside. They used lookouts. There was one near St. Peter where it was actually a hollowed out tree that they had a lookout in that was watching the road. Um, they had different sorts of setups and, and barns that they would look out of. Thrashers were used. This was a really interesting one that didn't come to me until I was talking to a gentleman who was telling me about his dad. Um, but if you think about a thrasher, um, they have a large boiler in them. And when they were produced in Racine in eastern Wisconsin, uh, different locations where they were transporting through, you know, that had a lot of extra space in it. And likewise, they were being transported on very heavy um, heavy-duty train cars or trucks. So one of the giveaways for a moonshiner's car was that it was so sodden down with booze that it was kind of riding on the rims. And so it was kind of a dead giveaway. But if you had to fill one of these boilers up with moonshine and it was already on a heavy truck, the average prohibition agent is gonna look at, isn't going to look at that and know any different. So that was fairly common where they would make a lot of shine over here and then ship it out to Minneapolis, for example, or somewhere else to make money off of it. The river dumps, um, there's both a written history that I found as well as interviews that I did. Where people talked about the river dumps. And what that basically meant was, if you can imagine a pasture with your cows in it and the, there's a river running through it, upstream of there, there might be a cheese factory. And if that cheese factory was making moonshine and had a lot of mash and suddenly it got busted, at that time there was no EPA, so they would just dump that all in the river. If your cows were downstream, they weren't going to pass on a good time. So, there were a couple of stories of, of farmers who would go out and their cattle or their dairy would be wandering around the pasture all gassed up. And uh, a couple where they actually just fell over drunk and they had to use stone boats to haul them in. So, um, that one's like, it, 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 I tell people that story and they're like, no way. It's like, it had to happen. Um, the one interview, the gentleman ended it by saying, now that's why we had such good cheese and milk in those days. Uh, so complicated cows is how I. Um, likewise, there's another gentleman I interviewed who was talking about he, um, his uh, dad owned a cheese factory and they were living above it and kind of farming the land. These guys from Chicago showed up and wanted to rent the cheese factory. And they said, we're going to turn it into uh, a cheese factory again. So his dad said, all right, sounds good. And they rented it out and paid the first month's rent. And suddenly, you know, Fred talked about, well, I remember watching them bring all this stuff in. It seemed like they were doing a lot of retrofitting, a lot of work down there. And they were always up late at night. They didn't know what they were doing all night. And this weird smell would come out and it was kind of sweet. It didn't smell like cheese. But they didn't ask any questions. And all of a sudden, there'd be these big piles of, of wasted corn sitting out there. And they'd think, what are, what, what's going on here? Eventually, his dad told them, you know, they figured out that they were making moonshine down there. But he thought, well, we're not going to say anything. These guys may be dangerous. Well, unfortunately, the cows would sometimes eat all of that spent grain and then be gassed up themselves. So it wasn't just if they were in the river, they were always at risk. Um, uh, he also talked about 
how he would reek like a still. So his dad had to spray him with perfume to cover up the smell. He said, I got a lot of guff because I smelled like a girl when I went to school, but it was better than being busted. Um, it was, again, talks about the symbiotic relationship between these moonshiners who came from out of town or employed local folks and, and paid them appropriately. Um, the, the following are a collection of stories that I found mostly as new, newspaper articles. Um, and so, first one was the moon trial of 1922. This is probably the first big prohibition thing to happen in, I'll say, the Fond du Lac in eastern Wisconsin, Fond du Lac County area. Um, and it involved a gentleman by the name of Peter Romick. He rented a farm one mile east of Piper, Cal Harbor, as it was called at the time. Um, he had a small pot still. And what he was doing was he was taking money that was supposed to be directed towards his wife and his children. She had end stage tuberculosis. They had, I believe, six children. He was taking money, assistance from the local charities, and he was using it to make alcohol and he was consuming it. <laughs> so it was really a sad story. Um, because uh, these children were being neglected and the wife wasn't being taken care of and he was just being a drunk. So kind of all the reasons that the temperance movement started, national prohibition came about, but it didn't make a tremendous difference, obviously. Um, the, the point is that it was really consumption versus distribution. He wasn't moonshining on a big scale. He was just abusing a system. And I happened to stumble upon the newspaper article. Uh, it was very sad. Um, the one point I'll bring up is he was from Campbellsport. <laughs> and depending on where I give that talk, that joke sometimes flies. <laughs> so uh, the Cap Welling bust of 1924. Um, some of you may remember the Roadhouse, which was located in Pebbles, Cheetah area. And it was a, a saloon, a, a hotel, and uh, Cap Welling was the guy who ran it. Um, it's kind of a long, convoluted story. It pans out over several months. Pretty interesting. And basically, the story is, is that Cap was selling alcohol there at the time. Um, he had bought what he thought was Crab Orchard whiskey from a distributor, let's call them, from a bootlegger. And he, uh, um, he tasted it and he said, this stuff is terrible. I'm not selling it. So he started in his basement. And at that same time, unbeknownst to him in Plymouth, the Crab Orchard Distillery kind of warehouse had been raided and had been robbed. And the police were kind of tracking where that all went. And so part of it had gone kind of to the Wolf Lake area. There was a party that was busted where there was a bunch of Crab Orchard discovered. And then they tracked it back to the roadhouse. And basically he was found with this stuff in his basement. Being the times that they were, he was taken <coughs> down, he was given a small fine, and he was allowed to go home that night. Um, he really didn't have a tremendous amount. He wasn't making anything. He was really just distributing it. Um, it. This was part of a federal operation. So I talked earlier about how there was no kind of teeth in the law. It was really left up to state and local entities if they were going to enforce the 18th Amendment. Likewise, if they were going to fund any sort of department to do it. The state of Wisconsin chose not to fund any sort of prohibition department. Especially on a local level, there wasn't any funding for any special enforcement. So the federal government, the Prohibition Bureau, would come through every couple of years and do a big sweep like this. And he got caught up in that federal investigation. Um, the story kind of ends abruptly with basically him going home after being arrested. And uh, I'm not sure what entirely happened. I kind of discovered the newspapers for about a year afterwards and wasn't able to find anything. But just in a situation where somebody got caught. Um, the Marytown bust uh, is kind of a fascinating story. And um, so it starts out with Sheriff Vandezander, and he's going out to Marytown to serve some sort of civilian court notice. I don't remember the specifics of it. But while he's in town, he's riding on the road, and he looks out and he sees this guy in a field with a horse and a wagon, and he just keeps going in a circle. So he delivers his court notice, and as he's heading out of town, he looks and he says, hmm, that guy's still going in a circle. Something's not. So he travels on down there with a the snow flyer, he says, sir, what's going on? He said, oh, shoot, you're here. <laughs> um, well, I was paid $50 to sit in this field and go in a circle until you left town. So the sheriff says, what's on the wagon? I don't know. Of course you don't. So they pull back the tarp. 
and here's like 500 gallons of mash ready to run. So he says, no, you don't know anything about this? And the gentleman says, no, no, I have no idea. I was just told to come out here and distract you, basically. Or, I'm sorry, kind of look busy. So the sheriff says, well, if you give me more information, I won't take you in. So he said, thinks about it, and then he says, well, if we go over in that fence line over there, there's a still berry. And he said, for a guy who's not involved in this, you sure <laughs> <don't> know. <laughs> So they go over to the fence line, they dig up the snow, uh, snow, and sure enough, there's a large copper still. So the sheriff makes this guy help him, they haul it, they get it into his vehicle, and then the, um, he lets the guy go. And as he's on it, he gets back to town, he notifies the press, and he writes up the story. Um, and then the interesting thing is when they ask him, well, what happened to the still? He says, I don't know. <laughs> so uh, that was a, that's a pretty entertaining article. So. Um, and then there's also the talk of the Marytown Swamp. Um, you know, a couple of people had talked about how there were stills in operation. So if you're not familiar, you know, County Double H, here's Keel Road. Uh, the pipe is kind of up over here, or I'm sorry, over here. And um, the road Double H kind of makes this bend as it goes through the swamp. And there's, uh, I was told that there's pretty big operation in this area. I was also told there's one in this area. Um, and, and one gentleman told me that there is a still still buried out there somewhere, so if you got some free time. <laughs> I think number two was my grandpa's farm. It was right there in the Marytown Swamp, and he was supposed to have been a big bootlegger. I just found this out recently. <laughs> <laughs> um, the final story I'll touch on is Gregor Nice. And this is probably the most famous story. You've, you've definitely heard parts of it, but you probably haven't heard the whole thing. So Gregor Nice uh, became infamous in the Fond du Lac, eastern, uh, northeastern Wisconsin area, about 1932, February specifically, February 12th. And his background was he was an insurance salesman in Fond du Lac here. I think he lived on Doty Street. Um, but he was originally from Mount Calvary. <coughs> And he belonged to the neat, nice bottling company, uh, yeah, nice bottling company in Calvary Station. Not the brewery, but the bottling company. And uh, when Prohibition came about, they tried to switch over <coughs> to making soda bottles and soda, and it didn't really work out. He went into insurance, and he was playing a very dangerous game. What he was doing was he was posing as a federal agent. He would find where stills were. He would go up to them, say he was a Prohibition agent. They would just out of routine bribe him. He would take the money and move on with his life. <laughs> well, that worked pretty well for Mr. Nice until 1932. And at within one month, there were three individuals who were doing the exact same thing as him that were found dead on the side of the road in the same fashion as him. So he was found dead on the side of the road, uh, Highway 23, across from C.D. Smith, so where Taco Bell is, across from C.D. Smith, if you are ever sitting there, that's where his body was found. <laughs> uh, and that was the area at the time, and um, those of you who probably remember, you know, Fond du Lac was certainly not that far to the east at the time, so that was in the country. Um, there was even talk about how there weren't street lights, there wasn't electricity at that point uh, in 1932 beyond there, so. That was kind of the country. So Mr. Nice was shot back, uh, twice in the back of the head. His body was tossed from the car. And then a bottle of moonshine was found under his body. Um, this was called taking a ride at the time. A little bit different than I think of, but apparently times have changed. Um, and the story was his uh, girlfriend at the time had said for about a week before they had received threatening phone calls. They had noticed vehicles parked on the street outside. He left for work, a vehicle pulled up beside him, and he got into it without being kind of forced into the vehicle, she said. And that was the last she saw of him. That was in the morning on February 12th. His body was found late that night. Um, and they said it, and the investigation basically said it was the same type of pistol used by the German, uh, it was a German pistol, used by the Chicago Mafia that was used in two other murders or attempted murders, one in the Kenosha area, and I don't recall where the other one was, and it was the exact same sort of MO. It was two shots to the back of the head, body dumped on the side of the road, bottle of moonshine under the body. The, he had no money taken from his wallet, he had an expensive watch which wasn't touched, it was very straightforward. Um, on March 1st, the case kind of goes cold. 
Uh, March 15th, there's a notice about his property being turned over to his mother, and that's really the end of it. I wasn't able to find a lot more about this case, uh, and unfortunately all the court documents were destroyed in the 50s or 60s, but I wasn't really able to investigate it further. Um, it's un I, I don't believe it was ever solved either. His body, he's currently buried in uh, Mount Calvary Cemetery, so if you ever want to head on out there, um, that's where he's buried. Uh, and this story was one that I would hear all sorts of myth and lore about. There's parts of it that said, well, he, his body was mutilated, uh, he had his genitals cut off and shoved in his mouth, those sorts of, sort of, oh my gosh, sort of things. Um, I went through his whole autopsy report, there's nothing of that sort, he had no mutilation of his body. Um, he just, very straightforward, had two gunshot wounds to the back of the head, bullets lodged in the front of his skull, and that was it. Um, some local stills. So uh, the one up here was from a gentleman by the name of John Ott. He's from Jericho. Heard about my research, called me up, said, hey, I got a still. And I'm like, all right, sounds good. So I drove up there, took a look at it. This was very, very typical of what kind of a pot still looked like. These weren't the massive, obviously, production ones that we think of or I talked about tonight. But these are the ones that folks would have in their barn to make a little bit extra cash or have something for fun. Um, this one down here came from my Uncle Dale. And so uh, my Uncle Dale and I were talking one day about this project, and he said, oh, Jay, I've got a still up in my barn. And if you know my Uncle Dale, I'd be like, I bet you do, Dale. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, no, really, I got this old, cool-looking still in the barn. So I said, well, let's go out there and look. And he had purchased an old turkey farm um, just south of pipe. So we go up into his barn, and sure enough, here's this beauty sitting, just like it looks right now. And so um, here we have just kind of the kettle, the net gooseneck here, the worm bucket there, the screws together. Um, very, very typical, again, these types of kettles, copper, very commonly used. That's all lead solder. So if you got one of these at home and you're thinking about firing it up because you need a new hobby, don't do that. <laughs> you're gonna end up, uh, you're gonna end up with lots of complications. So. Um, so my conclusion, basically, from my research, from the presentation today, is that subversion of the 18th Amendment during prohibition by the Holy Land population was to be expected based on a series of factors to include, but not limited to, the predisposed population, that German Catholic population, the availability of mechanically necessary components to physically make moonshine, the train, <coughs> the abandoned cheese factories, the barns, the logistics that were needed, and the economic assistance which the population as a whole benefited from. So it wasn't like just a few people got rich off of this. This was something that allowed communities to actually survive um, because the merchants made money, the farmers made money. Uh, it was kind of a whole collective thing. Um, and then finally, I'll end with prohibition is something everyone wants to know about but nobody wants to talk about. It's certainly kind of a dark period. People don't want it uh, until rather recently. People didn't want their families associated with moonshining, bootlegging, that sort of stuff. Um, but the fact is, is that it's a part of American history. It's part of our history. And so if you write it down and you seal it and say, don't open it until I'm gone, that's fine, as long as we get your story about it. Or if you're willing, uh, find somebody who's going to interview about it. Because um, now, is, now is the time to get those stories. So. Are there any questions, uh, comments, or stories? I just have a comment. Uh, talked about the German population uh, early on. There were more German immigrants to the United States than any other nationality. I can't vouch for Hispanics, however. But they came later. That's why they aren't as populous as the um, English. Also, Wisconsin had more German immigrants than any other state. I don't know if the other people are not. <laughs> Any other stories or comments? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Excuse me, I know where that moonshine cave is. I've been in it. <laughs> Always one. Always <laughs> one. Once, yeah. And I was a kid about 65 years ago. <laughs> but it's, you're right, it's in Chichita. It's in the prison. And could you tell me when the prison was built? And why it was built there? <laughs> I have no idea. Oh. Would you look that up, please? I, 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 I have no idea why, why is it built there. Uh, that is a great question. I will comment that the first um, 
the governor's first house is actually on the grounds of the women's prison. So, um, one of Pike's claim to fame that I like the most about is that in the 1830s, um, town of Calumet had more economic um, business than any other township in the in the state because of the harbor there. And so there was early on talk about the, the, the capital being in pipe, which I chuckle at. <laughs> so they, the, the first governor had built his, his mansion um, on the grounds of what is now the women's prison. Um, but it's so an interesting fact. I don't know why they built it. In your research, did you come across uh, any information of where, how far the runners carried the the booze, I mean, and where? Um, it was usually <coughs> local as in kind of eastern Wisconsin, so New London, uh, or they would transport to other locations which would eventually go to Chicago or Green Bay. Um, there's one uh, one article that talked about it going to Canada, which doesn't make any sense, because <laughs> Canada didn't have prohibition, um, and actually there's a lot of alcohol coming from Canada. Um, but I think it was mostly eastern Wisconsin and, it, and a good chunk of it. Um, what Al Capone comes up a lot, um, and I don't have any solid evidence that he ever stopped at Capone's in pipe, although I certainly think that the it's certainly reasonable to assume that. Um, and he did have stills in the area that when I interviewed people, they would talk about, well, that was a Capone still, that wasn't one of the other guys. And I think a lot of it went south to the cities. Um, and that's just kind of how the distribution is. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, when many of the German immigrants were coming toward Wisconsin, people wonder why did they pass up all the fertile land in Illinois and I, that, well, their answer was if it wouldn't grow trees, it wouldn't grow crops. And they kept coming right up to Wisconsin. But they passed up some of the most fertile land there was. Yeah, and that's when you look at um, why did the Germans settle the eastern side of, of Lake Winnebago, if you will, versus the western side, which was prairie and kind of an easier land to work. That was much of the argument was that that land had so much more potential in the long run. We mentioned the still near Billyville. Uh, there was, I read about that there might have been a, yeah, it's still near <laughs> On my uncle on the farm there, the other boys claimed that he had a skill in the farm. And that he also had met Al Capone on a number of occasions when he was making food that went to Chicago. So he had a pretty good operation. And he really liked Al Capone. He performed treatment really well. He was a very popular guy. Yeah.